On behalf of the Centre for Occupational and Environmental Health, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar uh, today. Before we get started and our guest is introduced, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. During this webinar, you will all be muted. So if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A option that you will see on your Zoom screen or into the chat box. Um, after the presentation at the completion, we'll spend five to 10 minutes in Q&A with our presenter. There is one continuing education contact hour available for this webinar. And if you wish to obtain credit, please register at coehce.org. And you will also need to complete an evaluation for the webinar, and then you'll be emailed your certificate. The webinar is being concurrently streamed on Facebook, and it will be available on our Facebook page after the event. Our monthly webinar series takes place on the first Wednesday of each month at 10.30 a.m. And next month on December 6th, we are very pleased to welcome Robin Dewey from the Labor Occupational Health Program at UC Berkeley talking on training workers with intellectual disability on health and safety at work. So having said that, I would like to hand over to Dr. Craner, who will be introducing our speaker for today. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jim Craner, occupational medicine physician. I am pleased to introduce Rich Meyer, who was recently appointed to the UC Berkeley COEH Advisory Board representing Nevada, and who has kindly offered to do this webinar on process safety management today. Rich obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Studies from the University of Nevada, Reno. He began his career with Nevada OSHA just after OSHA came into existence in the 1970s. Over the next 33 plus years, he served as a safety compliance officer, senior safety officer, safety supervisor, industrial hygienist, and IH supervisor, the last 23 years of which I came to know him in my role as an occupational medicine physician in the community. After his retirement from OSHA, Rich became a chemical safety consultant, which has included working with my chemical health and safety consulting team to assist companies in highly regulated industries. Over the course of his OSHA tenure, Rich conducted over 1,300 inspections at a variety of industries ranging from major casino hotel construction sites to small to medium and large sized chemical manufacturing plants. Prior to the creation of OSHA's process safety management standard in 1992, Rich had already become Nevada OSHA's go-to expert for major chemical accident and occupational disease investigations, which included major explosions, chemical releases, and fires. His expertise and accomplishments led OSHA to designate him as catastrophic event team leader and process safety management team leader for OSHA in the Intermountain West and California. Through his extensive varied experience at the technical and leadership level, Rich gleaned unique insight into how and why PSM programs succeed or fail. In today's webinar, Rich will provide an overview of the pyramid-based approach he developed for training other OSHA enforcement officers for inspecting chemical facilities and investigating disasters related to chemical safety. Thank you, Jim. Welcome. Uh, this is the title page. Here's my uh, contact information. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I arrived at this pyramid construct. First, with my staff on site walking a rubble field, I realized with multiple staff members helping me and assisting, I had to create some kind of method to control and task the staff and give them areas of responsibility. I started with a vertical uh, flow chart through the OSHA standard or through the elements of uh, the investigation that we needed to create. As time went on, I realized that verticality is really not the most appropriate way to try to control my staff. The uh, OSHA process safety management standard really looked to me more like a pyramid. And with the capstone uh, being the ultimate objective uh, would, would be the employer's compliance status. And with that, 
uh, in the last couple of years, I've really developed and, and refined this pyramid construct and have used it to train uh, employers and employees in OSHA process safety management. I, and I've used this pyramid to provide uh, a overview of the standard. The learning objectives are to understand the, the core concepts, the operational elements of the standard, and describe most importantly, a stru stepwise structured approach for a collaborative program implementation. How would you do that? I'll tell you in a moment. The core principles of process safety. Professionals in this business will say these are written in blood. The explosive manufacturers will say the same thing. Redundancy and group decision making, adopting and embracing the best practices, all important. The three M's, that's an explosive term. Also the military uses it. And they, that really is you minimize worker exposure to high energy or toxic materials. You maximize the distance between contributing masses of those materials. And you minimize the amount in each of those masses. So that's the three M's. That's the explosive guys say written in blood and they mean it. Here's the pyramid. The pyramid, basically the most important part of the pyramid is the foundation. And I like to work this pyramid starting at the right bottom corner, your site analysis, and then move over to the left cornerstone where really you start to assemble your, your library. And your library includes those three middle blocks, your chemical, information and uh, safety and health, the SDS kind of stuff. The block flow diagram was a, a simplicity to, and really emphasize uh, that that of the block flow diagram to me is a founding principle of how to put this together. It becomes your, your nodes to build within the process, your safety program within the process uh, safety commitment as well as your normal and general safety program. Your equipment design really deals with the technical requirements of all of the equipment. And your staff P and I, that's your participation and implementation program. Moving over to the left hand side again, we're talking about your contractor selection and your quality control oversight of that contractor. ERP stands for Employee uh, Emergency Action and Response Program. Confined space, lockout, tagout, and hot work are those representative OSHA programs that are required by the standard to be integrated and are part of the function of every uh, maintenance department and uh, operational uh, workers within the process facility and inspection and testing. We're back over to the top left again. Human factors analysis. That has to do with staffing, operator span of control, uh, shift communication. Operator, operational standard operating procedures. They are necessary. There's a lot of detail with them. You can't train if you don't have operational uh, standard operating procedures to train too. Mechanical integrity is uh, OSHA speak and process speak for your maintenance program and making sure there's no run to failure as was previously described as one of the principles. MOC stands for management of change. That's your deliberative structured uh, decision-making process, whether it's to adopt a change, to validate the efficacy of a change or uh, to say one is not needed, there's a structured process for every decision that, that is around change of the operating procedures. 
training. Now you have the things you need to train your operational staff. And that training could be two-tiered. And I'll discuss that. Process hazard analysis is the evaluation of the process and the command and controls uh, necessary to keep that process whole, protect the process, protect the workers, and protect the environment. Incidents, investigations, or audits, I located them next to the capstone because you don't have any of these when you first start up. But after you do start up, you have them, and it would be after the process has an analysis that any of those things could happen. And finally, the capstone is your process pre-startup safety review. That is required to be performed at before introduction of the hazardous chemicals, prior to the initial start, and after any management of change, or after any shutdown or turnaround within the plant. The chemical process safety uh, uh, site analysis is the right-hand cornerstone at the bottom level. It's extremely important. Really, what you have to think about is where are you? Who are your neighbors? What's your landscape and, and geology? And what's your weather? Are you in a warm environment or a cold environment or in northern Nevada, an environment that can be both? One minute uh, you're freezing, the next minute you're burning up. You also need to know about your neighbors and first responders. Do you want to locate next to a, a compressed gas liqu uh, liquefaction uh, facility, uh, a school or a hospital? I don't think so. Not if you're operating one of these plants. Nor if they tried to put one of those facilities there, you should protest and get the zoning group to not allow them to locate. You were there first. And finally, from the outside factors, you got to know where your first responders are and how far away they are. Your interplant uh, plant factors really are the three M's. Remember the minimize, the maximize, and the minimize. You also want to make sure that your staff buildings are not located next to high energy materials or underneath high pressure steam lines. <laughs> that uh, uh, it caused multiple fatalities in a historic Nevada inspection. You don't want to locate it next to bag houses that uh, occupied areas and next to bag houses that uh, evacuate uh, explosive uh, combustible dust. Your plant exits and roads are very important within your, uh, your process. You have to have multiple exits. Remember, that's that uh, redundancy. You have to have uh, roads that are such that heavy emergency response equipment can navigate within your plant and also drive within the process units if you want them to respond. If you don't have these good roads and easy access, your fire department and your emergency responders, they're going to stay on the outside and that will reduce their ability to adequately respond. And finally, uh, important element of uh, site analysis would be the location of your emergency response equipment. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. You could have a res uh, emergency release that restricts your access to the, that equipment. You have to have at least du duplicate sets of emergency response equipment available in case you can't access the other. This is that uh, left-hand cornerstone. This is your SDS information. Uh, and again, you have to have this information uh, or you're gonna have to develop it yourself if you're dealing with new chemicals. It's important to know all of this. You, you can't really design and staff and train without this information. Explosivity and corrosivity and reactivity a lot of times are not on your safety data sheets. You have to not rely on them as your only data source. 
There are plenty of other references out there, Merck, Sachs, uh, and so on. You can go and, and uh, add to the data you get from the safety data sheets. And if you can't find data, you're going to have to develop it. If, and this includes the raw materials, the reactants, and the finished products, as well as the maintenance chemicals used in your facility. Don't forget the maintenance chemicals. They could react with your process chemicals and cause big problems. The process technology and technical info, that is that block diagram uh, block. That's all, and these are all part of your library. And, and look what you need in your library. There's lots of stuff you need. The design codes, the national industry consensus standards, uh, they equal recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. Where there are no standards, OSHA will use those design codes and, and industry standards like the fire codes, the electrical codes, the building codes, to cite you general duty. Remember, all employers, regardless of what type of industry they're in, have an obligation to provide a workplace free of recognized hazards. Your diagrams, your, your uh, process uh, instrumentation diagrams, uh, your hazard zone classification diagrams, they're all important. My idea of an ideal library would have those three blocks where the information is available in paper form and computerized form. And remember, you don't want all your eggs in one basket, that principle of redundancy again. That library, ideally, my ideal library would have a nice big uh, conference table where at least eight people can get around and spread out these PIDs and wiring diagrams and create the nodes, do the evaluations required for the process hazard analysis, and also investigate your previous uh, operational history or help your operational history evolve if you're making changes using the deliberative decision making. Your employee participation plan is required and use your process blocks as nodes for implementation and training for your PSM and traditional safety programs. I'm reiterating this because it makes a lot of sense. You build from the ground up, just like the pyramid starts at the bottom, so does building up your safety program and your PSM training. Remember, workers and their representatives have access to what you develop. It's important that you are communicating what you find out and what you create to all parties where there's there's an obligation to let them know. Contractor selection and evaluation. We're back at the second level now. So now we've gotten through this first level. What could I do and how can I use that to task staff? You can put their names there. You can use this level horizontally as a timeline. So you put the person's name responsible for each of those blocks and use the horizontal level as a timeline to report on their progress in implementing those blocks or gathering that information or creating a library. So now with contractor selection and evaluation, you need to get what you pay for. The, uh, the best work is not always the low bid contractor. You need to know about that contractor's performance, how he's done in other facilities, what was the quality of their work, and have adequate quality control insurance for all construction and installation. A lot of firms, employers use third party, engineering consultants to do this work for them. That's fine. But just remember, you need to be involved as well as an employer to make sure that those consultants are doing their duty. You don't want to be faced 
with a 40 story building because of poor concrete, you won't get a, a permit of, to occupy because your elevator shaft is half a foot out of alignment at the 40th floor. This, some, this actually happened down in Las Vegas. So you have to stay on top of this and make sure you get everything. Unfortunately, you don't and will not recognize that you had poor quality in a lot of these materials until the failure of your concrete or the failure of connectors, uh, the failure of pipe hangers happen three or four years down the road and you have a major incident that you didn't plan for because of substandard installation or substandard quality uh, in the installation. I can't emphasize this enough. You gotta get what you pay for and ensure that it's of the highest quality. Your emergency action and response plan is extremely important. You can't put people in harm's way without an adequate emergency action and response program. You have to decide as an employer, are you going to respond to releases of hazardous chemicals? Are you gonna to try to control them? Are you gonna to try to clean them up? If so, you gotta meet 120Q, OSHA standard, and all of its requirements, which are quite detailed. I know, I helped develop and supervise uh, a hazmat team for Nevada OSHA for over 10 years. If you have a fire brigade, if you're gonna go beyond incidental uh, use of fire extinguishers, and that is once you've ex uh, expended two 10 ABC fire extinguishers on a beginning fire and it's still going, you're either gonna press the e-stops and hit the evacuation alarms, or if you're gonna continue and go get a fire hose, you have to meet the requirements of OSHA's fire brigade standard. That requires equipping and training equal to what the fire department uh, does. So you need to know that. And I will tell you, it's really imperative that you involve the local emergency responders at this point. Let them see your plant plans, let them, see what you're writing and what you plan to do and ask for comment. Even before you construct your plan, you'll get value, valuable information and you will start a relationship that's Im important and imperative for the safety of your facility and the safety of the first responders as well as your employees. And don't forget windsocks. socks. I recommend too, you could have a release of smoke or chemical that block an employee's view of the windsock. You always want to evacuate to that rally area that's upwind. You don't want to have only one rally area, at least two. Confined space, lockout, tag out, and hot work. These are all required OSHA standards. They're all required to be there and written and considered adequate for your facility before you actually hire your maintenance staff or your inspection staff. And they certainly have to be step-by-step -step, uh, instruction. And there's, there's gotta be an ability to pull guys out of confined spaces. You have to establish a method of locking out and tagging out and how are you gonna do it? You need to know and create a permit system for hot work. Those permits should be, one should be posted in the control room for every operator to see. Another should be out there where the work is being done. And they should be the same. <laughs> I've seen them when they're not. Confined space, you have to be able to evaluate your vessels and your billets and reactors and things and make sure that you have an ability to get your men in and out of there, whether it's for inspection, repair, or cleaning. And your process line breaking uh, has to isolate those confined spaces. You see that's why it's included in OSHA's 119 process safety management standard. 
the standard of the industry basically is double block blind and bleed. There are places in most facilities where that can't be accomplished, but where it can, your compliance officer is going to expect that it be there. And finally, please color code and permanently label all process components. I'm talking about valves, sensors, uh, breaker boxes. You have to be able to go back and, and validate you've got the right label using your PIDs. And if you color code your process flows, you will really help uh, enhance all of your descriptive SOPs in this facility. Human factors, Don't, can't tell you enough about how people involved with regula regulation of these process plants hate to see a single junior worker on the graveyard shift. So you have to have enough to ensure adequate safety. You certainly have to have adequate means of inner plant and between shift communication. Major accidents, multiple fatalities have occurred due to this breakdown of inner shift communication. Oh, we installed a valve backwards. You guys in the control room need to know that and tell the other guys when they come on shift that this valve off is on and on is off. That actually happened in a situation I was involved in. And your staffing at all times has to be adequate to meet confined space and emergency response duties. If you have to remove a guy who's had an accident in the middle of your facility, you have to have staffing adequate enough to pull him out and you have to practice that. It's not an easy task moving 200 pounds of dead weight. Dead weight. Mechanical integrity. This is the, your maintenance program. This is the heart of one of the fundamental things of your process safety program. There's no run to failure. Over and over and over again, running to failure is the primary cause of large accidents that you read about and we get to inspect, or I did inspect, uh, as an active enforcement supervisor. Remember that all of this must meet the recognized and generally accepted uh, good engineering uh, practices in your workplace as defined by industry consensus standards that for your piping uh, or for, for the uh, process safety relief valves is described for the chlorine industry or by the American Petroleum Institute, replacement parts uh, and service and inspection must meet uh, manufacturer's recommendations, and they have to equal the specified original equipment. If they are no longer available due to the age of your plant, or nobody's making them anymore, you got to use the management of change process to validate any potential new replacements. Again, no run to failure. Management of change. It, this is your deliberative, structured, written, managed process to deal with all change. It's quite involved. It is deliberative. It should involve at least two or three people. You do it. You get the worker from the node where the change is occurring that you've trained. Uh, a senior supervisor from that node your safety manager or designated safety person and a process engineer should be involved in this process. You need to have structured decision-making and utilize the same format every time. This is a place where boilerplate is really important to make sure that you check the boxes and you have sign-offs from the persons responsible that they agree with these principles within the management of change process. And then when it's done, you have to do a pre-start safety analysis before you restart the plant with this new different part or new chemical or new cleaning chemical in a maintenance operation. 
again, changing staffing. We got a service debt. We're cutting down the people. That has consequences. What happens if you cut out your laboratory people on the graveyard shift and one of your primary controls was no water in the process stream? You might not find out that that last sample taken that night that wasn't analyzed by the next shift was sitting in your laboratory after you've had a massive release because of a corrosive release of hazardous materials. So again, managing the change. No change without management. Nobody has a better idea. Nobody introduces chemicals to see what happens. All of this change is introduced and it managed so that there are no uninformed introductions of materials. Standard operating procedures and training. This is the how to do it for the operational staff. The requirement for manual walk downs annually, we call that in the standard a certification, annual certification. Truly uh, is an opportunity for extra training and staff building. What you do is you get an operator from a different part of the plant and give him another nodes or process blocks SOP and have him walk it down as the stranger and see if he understands it. And I like to do with two people. I was in a plant where they did this, they used two people to walk down from a different department, to walk down each of their standard operating procedures, and then present that to other operators at a monthly training session. It was a learning experience, both for management, the staff of that process block, and for the guys that were now finding out about the absolute detail of what another part of the plant did. It's a win-win-win situation. Some of your training can be two-tiered. You can utilize uh, videos on hazard communications and lockout, tagout, and uh, blind block and bleed. But make sure that the videos that you use directly reflect the practices and procedures you've implemented. They're out there. Same thing for mechanical handling equipment as well. Uh, but then the, the second level of training is hands-on by that supervisor or second level supervisor within that process node. You wanna make sure that there is documented comprehension that can be tested at the first uh, tier, but you want tests and observed comprehension understanding by the frontline supervisors and have him sign off that that employee understands everything about every standard operating procedure within his work area before you allow him to work on his own. And certainly any time that a failure to follow these standard operating uh, procedures is detected, don't yell at them. Start your corrective action procedures. You write it down. You formally task that guy with relearning that SOP, and you let him know there's no second chance. You do it our way or the highway. You're out of here because the safety of the process, the safety of his coworkers, and the safety of every other individual in that plant depends on following the standard operating procedures that have been agreed upon by your deliberative decision-making process. Nobody has a better idea. Nobody can introduce a new chemical on their own. Nobody has a shortcut without pushing it through your deliberative decision-making process and then changing your standard operating procedure. You need to have a tracking procedure as well just to 
choose and document which uh, version of the standard operating procedure I'm looking at. Is it the most current? So that again is part of codifying and documenting the evolution of these standard operating procedures to make sure the ones out in the workplace are the ones that are also in the library as the latest greatest example of how to put part A into part B. The process hazard analysis. This is truly can be a complex thing if, it's a, if it is a complex product and a complex process. You really have to have a method that's appropriate to the complexity of the process. The work product can be tremendous and it can go on for quite a while. It's required to be repeated every five years. It's something you need to start doing at the third year. If you haven't started after your, your old PHA is three years old, you're fooling yourself if you have a complex plan. Uh, you see what the slide says? And, and again, you also incorporate any accidents or upsets or any, any incident investigations. And it truly requires a team approach. This is where you want to do this in your library. That's my ideal library with all the SOPs and the uh, consensus codes and your industry codes all there that available for you to reference. Uh, as well as computers that you can go online and reference things on computers at the same time. And you need a qualified person to lead you through this. There are engineering experts that do nothing but this. And they're good at it. And, tr and if you have a very complex plant, I urge you to engage one of those people. It's important that you do this right and you have a good system to track your recommendations and that everything is resolved before you restart by introducing the chemicals back into the process. Incident investigations. Something that's almost always overlooked. Well, what happened? Why did it happen? Oh, I don't know. We, well, he hurt himself, but well, there's a lot to be learned. Don't make workers to be afraid of reporting near misses or minor injuries. They're symptomatic of greater failures in your design. Over and over again, I've been in workplaces to where if somebody hurts himself, they're afraid to tell, to talk about it to a supervisor or report it because that means they're going to be sent out for a drug test. That penalizes you getting information from the ground up as somebody that's managing this process uh, as a safety supervisor or an engineer or uh, owner or superintendent of one of these facilities. You see what the criteria of the investigation consists of, a formal report, is required, oh, that's too much work. We'd rather penalize the employee for reporting it than to go through all of this. Near misses can be very illuminating and point out real problems within your process that aren't brought to light if you ignore them until they become catastrophic. I have real life examples of what happened and why, just for this reason. So again, Encourage workers to report near misses. No release is insignificant, but certainly the law says that if there's any potential of a catastrophe, well, what is a catastrophe? I'd say myself, as a regulator, any release that can harm a worker has catastrophic potential, needs to be investigated. If you ignore it and somebody files a complaint, the compliance officer comes out there, trouble. Once you find out what happened, 
and what the contributing factors were. You need to communicate that and what the recommendations are to resolve this situation and communicate it to everyone, everyone that's involved, as well as a plant-wide posting. It's important that you, these are documented because they become very important tools when you redo your process hazard analysis. If you're not doing a good job here, you won't have a good hazard analysis. Your pre-startup safety review. Your pre-startup safety review looks like, oh, not much. But truthfully, this is where you go back and audit that all of the previous blocks of this pyramid are in place. It, I recommend that it's at least a two-man job. You have to do this for new or modified facility changes the, uh, required by the management of change process. Any modification that, that requires a change in process information. Any uh, construction stop work order uh, has to be go through this process. Uh, any in any your operational and maintenance and emergency response standard operating procedures have to be looked at for adequacy and degree of implementation before you introduce those chemicals prior to the very first start and after and I mean and before any restart before any chemicals are introduced into the process again the PHA has to be complete and all findings are resolved this is low hanging fruit for the compliance officer if it can't be resolved uh, then what are the workarounds better have a good story and you better have an engineering report as to why it was impossible to resolve it. There's always solutions for every problem. And the training and retraining depended upon the timing of your pre-startup safety review for any changes and any modifications that have come into the practice, into the process has to be completed before you start this up. Seems like it could be a simple checklist, but this is not something you want to pencil whip. This is something you want to spend some time on and make sure, because what are the most dangerous times in a chemical plant history? Any time you have a startup, any time you have a restart, or any time there's been some kind of problem and you had to shut it down and bring it back up. So that's why you have this requirement for the, the two previous uh, slides, the incident investigation and the pre-startup review. These are very important. Just can't pencil whip this stuff. Now I wanna go back to my original pyramid and talk again about implementing and creating responsibility. Each of these blocks, you can have a person's name in the block. They're responsible for that part of the library. We're now on the bottom left with the Kim info. They're responsible for the, the technology of the processing, making sure you have all the history, their name right there. And again, with whatever staff and how you do it, you put their names in those blocks. That's, they're responsible for that. And then at the lines that go horizontal across the pyramid, those become your timelines. Have that, have a report to me in, in, in our PSM committee meeting as to what's going on by such and such a date. That's the way you task people for each of these blocks and you create responsibility, credibility, and 
reportability of each of these. It's important that you go through this systematically from the bottom up. The Great Pyramids weren't built in a day. They were built block by block. They, there was a method and a very mechanical method of assembling these pyramids. And with that being said, uh, I'm ready to entertain some questions. Oh, thank you so much for that informative presentation. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody in the audience that we can take questions, if you could enter them through the Q&A or the chat. Um, our presenter will spend some time answering questions. I, um, while we're waiting for questions, I wanted to ask you a little bit about reporting near misses that have catastrophic potentials you talked about. And I wondered if you could speak to what are some of the barriers and, and, and is there any kind of estimation of un, under-reporting typically? Uh, I believe that is chronically underreported because it points the finger at the operators who are on duty at that time or the maintenance employee that didn't properly tighten down uh, the bolts on a flange or uh, a failure of somebody to complete an assigned task. And you, so as part of your training, you have to make them aware that any upset, any failure is a learning incident, not a punitive action to be followed. Uh, so long as they followed the operational SOPs and the training that they have been given on how to perform that task. So yes, they're horribly underreported. Uh, and in there in Northern California, you have a wonderful example uh, of that uh, in a recent major release by the largest oil refinery in Northern California to where there were people reporting that things were leaking and they just kept limping along and, and continue to produce instead of running to failure. And then, boom, here comes the failure. So they ignored the reports from, this, from the workers on the ground that, hey, we have a little leak here. We need to investigate it. Finally, the leak was such that they had to investigate it. And in the process of pulling off the insulation around this large recirculation pipe in a, in a crude unit, they punctured the pipe and a massive release followed. Hmm. Well, um, I, I think Dr. Craner would like to ask a question. I think he's unmuted if he'd like to. Yes. Sure. Um, Rich, that was a great presentation. Uh, given the complexity of what you described as an interrelated, iterative approach represented by this pyramid, why do you think boilerplate type PSM programs don't work? And secondly, um, to the extent that you can answer it, uh, does OSHA recognize when a company has a lot of fluff, but not a lot of substance? A absolutely. Boilerplate where you fill in the blank doesn't really show to the investigator, especially after a significant incident, that there was true comprehension. And, uh, and employees understood what they were doing. It's like they sit through and sleep through a training program. And also boilerplate doesn't really document the actual training itself and its adequacy. And so really what the inspector is looking for is a description of the training and the record keeping and 
what was done to ensure comprehension. So your Thank record you. keeping can be enhanced by uh, computerized programs that track training and prompt training, but the content of that training and some of those programs can actually be uh, inputted as well as the worker's level of documented comprehension or his score on a test. That's fine, but nothing beats also next in that employee's training record, a supervisor report of the on the job training that he observed before he authorized that employee to perform that task unsupervised. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, please, you can enter a question in the Q&A for us and uh, we have some time to answer. Um, I wondered sort of, I guess, out of my lack of knowledge of this, um, just um, when you, you mentioned about staff responding to hazardous chemicals, and I wondered, is it actually optional for companies to have staff be able to respond? And if they can opt out, who does have to respond in that situation? It, 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 well, that's a very good question because an employer can say, we're only training our people up to the awareness level, which is the lowest level of training required in the OSHA standard uh, 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 emergency response train, training standards, uh, 1910-120Q. And well, then they're gonna have to bring in a hazmat contractor to quote, stop the leak mm. or clean up the mess. And they're gonna have a lot of downtime and a potential uh, environmental contamination, as well as probably uh, the chance that this reaches a level to where the regulatory people, both OSHA and uh, EPA's Chemical Accident, Accident Prevention Program, gain knowledge of this, and they're gonna come take a look at what this employer is doing, and he's gonna say, hey, you gotta do better than this. You just can't let this leak go on because it, leaks are that grow. They get bigger. The problem doesn't take care of itself. So committing that time and effort to train up employees that can respond at the highest response levels under the OSHA standard, and that means uh, maybe level A, a team of four, one air, uh, two, to provide rescue and backup, to to uh, go and retighten or, or or tighten down a flange that was leaking, and and finally a group set up to uh, similarly outfitted to decontaminate the four guys that might be involved in that. That's the level of complexity that that employer has to train his people up to uh, to deal with these situations. We have a couple of other questions. Um, one is saying this is a good amount of necessary work and I understand having employees involved in these activities is critical. Generally, how many health and safety staff are successful per chemical process plant? Uh, are required, it depends on the size and complexity. I would say you need at least two uh, safety and health personnel in each plant. You can have one, but if you have a complex plan, how can that person accomplish all the training and all the oversight and all the analysis just by himself? The guy will go crazy and end up leaving you to go to another employer. Uh, and we would say, as the enforcement arm, we would say, uh, sorry, but making your maintenance superintendent your safety officer is not going to cut it. Why? Because the maintenance superintendent, he's going to just try to get her done instead of 
worrying about no run to failure and do my uh, inspection and testing to prevent those kind of failures or, uh, or uh, pump failures or things that where the, the, in, the instrument or the uh, pump or the piece of equipment fails and needs to re be replaced. So they're not, you know, you can't really say one, one guy can do it all, which we often find in small facilities because they're not compatible. The safety officer should report to the manager, shouldn't report to the maintenance superintendent. That's another part of it. Who does he report to? So again, that tries to help, but it's difficult uh, to absolutely specify how many you need. It's based on the complexity. Um, thank you. Another uh, person says, great presentation, thank you. Uh, what have you found as successful ways to engage employers and management on the value of embracing the PSM? Uh, do they like their factory? Do they like to continue to run for 40, 50, 60 years without a major process incident? Then don't run to failure. Embrace this program. We haven't had a major oil refinery built in America in the last 50 years. So the big companies are doing something right. It's only when they get greedy and they push beyond the service life of components that they have failures. Um, thank you. I've just time for one more question. And that is um, a, a participant asked, what should I do if I'm not getting a um, material safety data sheet from my supplier for a particular chemical? Tell him you're going to send it back. Okay. <laughs> uh, your purchase order's canceled. It's that important. Uh, I it was involved in an event to where a, 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 a PVC pipe failed because they used a different glue instead of the specified glue. And that reacted with the chemical that that pipe was transporting. Simple as that. Well, well, thank you so much. This really was a great informative presentation and really appreciate you taking the time to share this knowledge uh, and all your expertise with us. Um, so thank you. And I just want to say to everyone, another reminder that um, next month on December 6th, we, uh, our presentation is from Robin Dewey, and she is going to be talking about training workers with intellectual di disability on health and safety on the job. So again, thank you very much. And um, thanks everyone for listening. Bye-bye.